Pixel Therapy is a member of the But Why Though Podcast Network. Go to butwhythopodcast.com for an inclusive geek community offering pop culture news, reviews, and podcasts. The way that people act with media is something that is integral to the human condition. Mm. Us sharing stories with each other, us making legends, what our fairy tales mean to us, what our tropes are, why they're important, why they keep coming, why they make them make us feel the way we do. How we share media with each other, what we make after seeing certain pieces of media. The study of that is as important to me as other anthropological fields of study. Welcome to Pixel Therapy, the video game podcast where we look at the games we play through the lens of the player, where what you play is just as important as how you play it, and where emotional intelligence is a critical stat. Every three weeks, we bring on a guest who may or may not consider themselves a gamer to discuss the games that have made them and changed them, and all the feelings they have about our favorite pastime. I'm your co-host, Jamie, pronouns she, her. And I'm your co-host, Spencer, pronouns they, them. And this is Pixel Therapy. A uh, quick bit of news uh, to get started here, and you may have caught this in the intro <laughs> if you're a sharp-eared listener. That's right. <laughs> but if you are one of those folks who is marking your calendar week to week <laughs> and really keeping tabs on when our episodes drop, um, we have a, a bit of an announcement for y'all. Uh, we are going to be moving the podcast from an every other week release schedule to an every three weeks release schedule. Um Hopefully this is not uh, breaking anyone's heart, <laughs> ruining anyone's day, um, but this is a decision that Spencer and I need to make uh, to both help us stay consistent with the podcast and uh, just continue to keep it sustainable for us. That's it's right. really important that we continue to do this uh, to both of us, and it's really important that we continue to give you like the highest quality content that we can, <laughs> um, or at least in our eyes, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you can judge whether or not we're hitting that bar. That's um, right. But yeah, it's there's a lot going on in the world. There's a lot going on in our personal lives. Um, and so we just need to take that slightly slower pace uh, mm-hmm. to continue to be able to do this for y'all because we don't want to stop doing it. It's really important to us to keep doing it. Um, but we just need a little a little more space. So That's right. thank you all for your understanding. The podcast will now be coming out every three weeks. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we'll still be doing the Patreon. There'll still be Patreon bonus episodes, perhaps those just became even more valuable uh, <laughs> for those of you uh, who who are maybe subscribed to the Patreon, but not always listening to those episodes, or maybe you've been thinking about subscribing to the Patreon. And well, if now's you your chance. Us. If you miss yeah. us, if you're sitting there like, darn, I could really use an extra episode of Pixel Therapy this month. Guess what? Have I got a thing for you? And that's for just two dollars. For just two dollars. <laughs> all uh, yours. <laughs> Patreon.com slash pixel therapy pub. Um so speaking of Patreon, let's do our Patreon shout outs. Uh this is our special thank you to everyone who subscribed at our Patreon name in the credits tier. And today we're shouting out everyone who supported us in the month of June, uh, which means this is a very big thank you to Genevieve, Lindsay, Jackie, Ben, Pimhatai, and Adiyinka. Thank you all so much for your support. Remember, if you want to get your name in the credits, you can hop on over to patreon.com slash pixel therapy pod, where you can subscribe for as little as just $2 a month, like Spencer just mentioned a minute ago. And uh, that'll get you access to that monthly bonus series, which we do call co-op mode. Our June Patreon episode, uh, Spencer and I were breaking down who should play all of our favorite characters in the recently announced God of War and Horizon Zero Dawn TV adaptations. So again, if you're itching for some more pixel therapy uh if you want to hear our <laughs> our casting decisions our unhinged takes <laughs> our unhinged takes yeah that's a good way to put it um yeah go over there to patreon.com slash pixel therapy pod and check it out uh but if you're a fan of what we do here on pixel therapy and you're not interested in the patreon that's okay please do consider sharing us with your friends and family rating and reviewing us on apple podcasts or you can even write into the show and send us an email at pixeltherapypod at gmail.com. We would love to hear from each and every one of you. All right, it's time to get cozy. Pull up your armchair. Feel free to lie down on the couch. Let's talk about our feelings. Spencer, how are you? I'm great, Jamie. I actually, <laughs> we were talking for almost two hours before we started recording, <laughs> and I forgot to ask you, um, <laughs> did you see the new Thor Love and Thunder movie? Oh my God. Yes. Yes, of course oh I did. 
Same you, you saw it as well, right? Yes. Yes. And I loved it. I think it <laughs> might be up there in my top five favorite Marvel movies. Oh my um, goodness. I loved it so much. And it even inspired me to go watch more Taika Watiti. I'm watching Our Flag Means Death, um, his oh, nice. show um, about gay pirates. Um, <laughs> Which I I started watching this show and kind of stopped, started and stopped. It's it's a little slow to warm up, I think. Mm. But by episode three, it really starts hitting its stride. And it's just the most, it's such a breath of fresh air on TV right now. I highly recommend it. But anyway, Thor, what did you think? What did you think? (laughs) Thor Love and Thunder. Okay, so I, I liked it. I don't think it's as good as Ragnarok, which was the previous Taika Waititi Thor movie. Mm. I <laughs> I want to see Thor Love and Thunder again because I think a second viewing mm. will. Uh, I don't know. I, I experience this a lot with movies like the first viewing, especially when you come in with hype. Yeah, um, I just feel like it's hard to fully experience it and feel like you left the theater like fully like grasping like what the movie was i don't know Mm. i have this happen with a lot of mcu movies with the hype and usually on a second viewing i find that like some things have shifted with how i felt about the movie so for me personally i did enjoy it i laughed pretty hard at several (laughs) moments it's a very funny movie i definitely think it's more of a comedy than it is uh like a superhero action movie yes and so for me i think tonally i've felt it struggled a little bit because I think it sets up a really like Christian Bale's villain of Gore the God Butcher is a really creepy character. I think he's really well portrayed by Christian Bale. Mm. I like his motivations. I think he's an interesting villain. I think he feels like he's in a very different movie (laughs) Mm -hmm. from the rest of what's happening in Thor Love and Thunder. It's also like such an efficient movie. It's so efficient. It's just under two hours, which has like not happened for an MCU movie in forever. Mm. And like there's nothing wasted in that movie. Like there's no, no, despite all the jokes and stuff that they have in the movie, like it hits, like they get through, there's a lot that happens and they get through that narrative. Yeah. Like there's no extra scenes. There's no fat to trim. Yeah. They cover a lot of ground. (laughs) And in some, at some points I kind of wanted there to be a little more fat. Mm. Like I kind of felt like Valkyrie got a little short shrift Mm. shifted, shifted. I like wanted a bit more with her. She gets a conversation to like, let us know what's going on with her. Mm. But like, we don't actually get to see anything happen with her. You know, I love uh, mighty, the introduction of mighty Thor, Mm. Jane Foster being Thor is so cool. But like, I don't want to spoil anything, but this is kind of like the Mighty Thor movie that we're going to get, and we're mm. not necessarily going to get more. And that kind of sucks. Like it got int- it gets introduced, and I mean that that second end credit scene. You never know. That's all I got to say. Fair enough, but um, <laughs> I don't know. I did I did like it. I don't. I feel like it sounds like I'm hedging a little bit. I think it was just it wasn't. It was unexpected. It was yeah. unexpected, and I think the amount of jokes while I was laughing quite a bit and enjoying them. I feel like in Ragnarok, what I think is so great about Ragnarok is that it gets the dramatic moments and the MCU superhero stuff like that. That stuff has space to breathe. And we get these epic moments throughout the thing and the jokes, the silly, absurd humor that Taika Waititi does so well. Those are peppered in in such a way that every time you get this moment of absurdity in the midst of something more serious, it really pops and hits really hard and Mm. like really makes you laugh. And I think in Thor Love and Thunder, the absurdity is so consistent Mm. that it loses some of its power. Mm. Because what what I think really works with absurd humor is is when it feels like it's coming out of nowhere. And I think when it's happening so frequently, like it doesn't throw love and thunder, it takes a little bit away from it. Like I'm not as surprised by the jokes because they're constant. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I don't know, but you're like <laughs> laughing as I'm talking. I'm, I'm guessing you're like remembering <laughs> yeah. key moments. That really, There's a lot to laugh at in the movie. It's a really fucking funny movie. Uh, yeah. I'm just, yeah. I'm, I'm laughing as Jamie's talking. Cause I'm just remembering how many <laughs> jokes they managed to pack in so and many. just how it was such a romp from start to finish. Mm-hmm. I think too, my opinion of it is influenced by the fact that I saw, um, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, like mm. two days before I went to see this movie. Um, complete 
tonal juxtaposition. Like, <laughs> yeah. you were really watching a Sam Raimi movie first and a Marvel movie second with, yeah. with that one. Um, and I think there's a part of me that, um, like, when you're talking about the absurdity, when you're talking about the unexpectedness, the way it leans so hard into humor, mm-hmm. I think... Again, speaking to, I think what makes our discussion so rich is the fact that we kind of approach things from complete opposite ends of the spectrum. And those were all the things that I loved about it. Like, I Uh think for me, now that we're 25 plus Marvel (laughs) movies in, I'm starting to get kind of sick of the formula. Mm. And there's something about the way it feels like this next generation of movies is sort of just handing the reins to these different Mm -hmm. directors and being like, you interpret this. Yeah. And there's something about it that feels almost like experimental. Like it, it's, it feels like we're really throwing away this whole, like, it feels like culturally we've all decided this is what a superhero movie is. This is what an action movie is. This like for Marvel, we're working off the blueprint of the comics. So there's a certain level of seriousness and expectation that comes with that. Like there are diet, diehard fans coming to these movies with a very strong picture in their minds of what it's quote unquote supposed to be. Yeah. Um, And that's great. And I love how I'm sort of thrown for a loop by these directors just completely taking their own spin on things. And and it almost starts to feel like, like fan fiction or like a creative reinterpretation of the source material. And that to me is just so exciting yeah, I don't, know, I don't even know if I can fully articulate it, but it just feels almost like I'm seeing theater or something. Like, it's like these familiar <laughs> characters, these familiar expectations are just completely thrown out the window. And the same character that was saying something with complete seriousness in a previous film from six years ago is now in this film, like, completely refreshed. Like, I just love that we're still able to go in new directions with these characters mm-hmm. that we've known for so long. So I think if anything, that's what catapulted it to the top of my list is just, I had so much fun watching Thor Love and Thunder. And I absolutely agree. I was talking to um, my movie viewing group (laughs) after (laughs) the film and just sort of about like, yes, absolutely. Christian Bale's character. I almost felt like we needed more time with him to sort Mm -hmm. of see how, you know, how these powers corrupted him or or how he Mm. got to the point where he was going to the lengths that he did without Mm -hmm. spoiling anything. I just felt like there was a little bit more characterization that could have been filled in there, but I was having so much fun with Thor and, um, was it Stormbringer, his hammer? And <laughs> is it Stormbringer or Breaker? Stormbreaker, uh, and the whole Stormbreaker Thor Mjolnir love triangle that like I didn't even <laughs> care. Like I was so invested in these inanimate objects yeah. that I didn't even. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like I don't, I don't even want to say more than that. But I just this movie was just nonstop laughs and mm-hmm. i still cried though i laughed i cried yeah had a great time um yeah i can't wait to see more unhinged zaniness from marvel <laughs> yeah no and i i completely agree with you on the fact that i i think there's a lot of folks who have kind of been criticizing the current phase of the mcu for being a bit like each movie feels more specific and therefore less like oh you know what are we building to or what are people doing with these characters and while within you know even within multiverse of madness you know we talked a bit i know i have there's things that i don't like about that movie Mm -hmm. but i do think overall i'm really on board with marvel taking swings and letting the directors have more creative control and like, yeah, trying to break the mold a little bit because we're always going to have those first few phases. We're always going to have that build to end game and how awesome that was as far as like superhero storytelling goes. Um, But the Marvel universe is huge. And even within comics, uh, there's so much space for new creators to come in and tell stories and and do interesting things with characters. And I love that we're starting to get to that point with the movies now too, where things don't have to feel quite so tight. Um, 
they can still, you know, still feels like it's of a piece. I don't feel like there was anything they did in Thor Love and Thunder that negates, you know, and of course all the articles come out. They're like, oh, this thing like completely ruins the plot of Endgame mm-hmm. because of X. And it's like, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Let's yeah. calm down. Um, yeah, I, I just I don't I don't love lore police. Yeah. <laughs> Let like, us enjoy things. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I think I think it's really cool. I'm excited to see it again. And I definitely laughed a lot. Let's watch it together again. Yeah, let's do it. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So, you know, this is a video game podcast, Spencer. (laughs) Have you been playing any video games? Have you found time for that between all your movie viewing with all your cool movie group friends? It's becoming a video game slash Marvel podcast, (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that's fine. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, so last episode, I had just started sinking into Fire Emblem Three Houses, um, which came out in 2019. Um, And now that we're a couple weeks later, I've amassed 90 plus hours (laughs) with Fire Emblem. Holy cow. And that was just playing one storyline. So, so, and let me just sort of um, context set a little bit again. Um, in Fire Emblem Three Houses, um, it takes place in the continent of Fodlan, uh, which is inhabited by three distinct um, kingdoms. Um, and these kingdoms have generally existed in somewhat of a peaceful state. There have been wars here and there, but at the time of the game's opening, um, the three kingdoms are at peace. And a lot of that is fueled by the fact that there is this um, school that is funded and overseen by the dominant religion church in this land. And at this school, students come from all three territories. Um, They learn together they dine together they're um you know they're they're in these three houses that sort of represent their three lands um but they share everything and they and they grow up together um and you come in as a mercenary turned professor sort of training this next generation of holy warriors to go forth and enforce the will of the church so the really cool thing about this game is that when you start at the near the beginning of the game, you choose which house you as the professor are going to align yourself with somewhat Harry Potter esque, some might say. Um, And when you choose a house, those students kind of become, they are under your wing. You're helping each of them grow. You're teaching them, you're leading them into battle. Um, And fire emblem has two modes. There's classic mode where if someone falls in battle, they're gone. So that this person Mm. that you've spent time with, that you've talked to, that you've developed a relationship with, they're gone for the rest of the game. Um, The game also has casual mode. (laughs) What'd you say? I said, fuck that. Yeah, fuck that. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I was like, no, no thank, thank you. you. <laughs> I will be a filthy casual. Thank you very I much. I will be a proud, filthy casual. <laughs> that's what I was. In casual mode, um, it's more traditional, like, oh no, my person's been reduced to zero hit points. They're going to retreat from this Sick battle. Little nap. And we little will see poop. them later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just sleep it off. <laughs> exactly. So I got to the end of my playthrough where I had aligned myself with one of the houses. Um, And the story is epic in scale, um, spanning almost a decade of in-game time. Um, And so you really get to see all of your students grow up. um, And eventually you're led into somewhat of a holy war Mm -hmm. um, against the other countries. And I don't want to spoil much of the story but now that i'm on the other side of it i just wanted to kind of talk through some of the themes of the game because it really affected me and i think i'm a staunch fire emblem fan i'm really late to the party (laughs) but i just this game really awakened a love of strategic jrpgs in me and i this is a genre i thought i would never be into like i gladly hear people talk about like Final Fantasy Tactics being really like the classic that people speak mm, to in mm-hmm. terms of tactical role playing. Mm-hmm. Um, and Fire Emblem, the Fire Emblem series is another where people really point to as being um, one of the best in the genre. And I just sort of, I don't know why, I do like turn based battles, but the strategic element where even the movements and the sort of looking down, top down on a grid, and it all felt a little too complicated to me and maybe too slow. 
Um, but instead I found that I've, I've really taken to it. Like it almost, I think it combines my love of board games and my love of video mm. games into one yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm 28 years old and just now discovering <laughs> something new that I love about video games. So every thank day's you, a, video every day is an adventure. <laughs> every day is a winding road. <laughs> Get a little bit closer. <laughs> so amazing with fire emblem. Um, you know, I spent 90 hours getting through my first playthrough. <laughs> it's really interesting, though, because you really... First playthrough. My Sorry, first we playthrough, just need to yeah. pause there. I spent 90 hours getting through my, my first, first playthrough. playthrough. Yeah. <laughs> End quote. And I already started New Game Plus oh joining a different house. Like, I'm so... I'm, like, You're still in. in it. You're in it. Wow. I don't know if I'm going to fin it, if I'm going to do a true, like all three houses like i think i'm gonna just kind of casually play it from time to time and maybe okay. in a few months i might pick it up again and really start from scratch uh -huh. um but something really cool about the game is that you inherently cannot get the full story of like why we're going to war why we're fighting for the church why people are like why this conflict is even happening like you really only get your own house's perspective into the conflict and who is right um, and at first I was kind of frustrated by that. Like when the game ended, I was like, but I wanted a few more answers as to like some of these other mysteries that were going on. Um, and really you're going to have to spend like over 200 hours to really get that whole, um, <sighs> thing, which honestly is kind of like for a switch game. Uh, that's pretty cool. Like that, that really is a lot of the game is giving a lot. Like if you yeah. really like a JRPG and sinking into that, like there's, there's a lot of replay value. Um, mm -hmm. And even there are some choice decisions you can, you are given the option to make throughout the game. I would and, think there'd be a lot of repetitiveness in there though, in replaying. I mean, I think you'd be surprised because I thought there'd be a lot of repetitiveness too, but there's, a lot that you don't see because you are aligned with a certain house, okay. like more than you'd expect. Okay. Um, which, which was surprising to me too. Like, mm -hmm. like even, even down to the types of battles you're having, like, I think that would be the most repetitive thing about the game is having to mm -hmm. go through the same battles, but depending on which house you align yourself with, like the house that I align myself with was called the yellow deer. Mm -hmm. There's the yellow deer, the blue lions and the black eagles. And my house uh, was mostly archers and mages, so lots mm -hmm. of long distance fighters. Mm -hmm. um, I think the Black Eagles is lots of up close, like swords and axes. Mm -hmm. um, and then the Blue Lions is a mix of like magic users and a lot of mounted. Um, like uh, mounted on horses or mounted on dragons type of fighters. Okay. Uh, like spears and stuff like that. So yeah, you yeah. end up having very, very different battle techniques um, okay. based on who's in your party. Yeah. So it's like the battles are different. And then it's just so much of Fire Emblem is realizing that you're limited by your own perspective. Um, mm. I think that it's it's very easy to take a tactical role playing game like this at face value and be like, I go to battle, I defeat all the enemies, I win, and I move on. Mm -hmm. Fire Emblem really forces you to reflect on your beliefs and why you believe them. Mm. Um, it really forces you to pause and consider like, is fighting even what I want to do? Mm. Um, and, and and it's like, you know, by the end of the game, you've done over like 50 battles. And so I think by the by the last 25 percent of the game, maybe battling just becomes routine. Like, mm -hmm. like I, I know what I'm supposed to do and I'm strong enough now that I can probably like I can one hit most of these enemies if I wanted to. So it's really about um, what kind of. Where we are, are you going to, what kind of technician are you going to choose to be? Are you going to be a, a like totally like scorched earth, like fuck all y'all? Or are you going to sort of consider what you're doing, not just how good you are at doing it? Mm. Um, like I was, and, and what I mean by that is like literally you have to fight the, <laughs> like this is, I guess, a light spoiler, but probably standard for any Fire Emblem game, but it's like, you end up having to fight people you know. Um, like mm -hmm. as the professor, even though I was aligned with one house while I was raising these students, you know, you 
become friends with students in other houses. They come to you for advice. Um, they might take a seminar that you're teaching. You might be able to ask them for help on certain missions. Um, and then suddenly you're across the battlefield from them. And I think the game really, for a game about war, I don't think Fire Emblem wants its players to celebrate war in any way. Mm. It repeatedly reminds you that war is suffering, that war is cruelty, and that there is no good or bad side. Um, I'm not, I don't think I want to necessarily like, um, like I think the game is is saying that any war is bad. Like humans shouldn't be killing each other, and mm -hmm. also that hum at the end of the day we're people. Like we're not just machines with weapons. Like we are individuals being put into this conflict by a power that's outside of our control. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't. I'm not making any sort of real world direct comparisons and saying that like oh there are good people on both sides because like uh, mm -hmm. I think that's a nuanced conversation and like. Yeah. Like if you're going to ask me about like the Israel and Palestine conflict, I'm absolutely like pro Palestine. I'm not saying like, yeah. oh, genocide is fine because there's good people on both sides. Mm -hmm. But like war is is not as black and white as I think many video games, especially, would have you believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the fact that um, you know they're putting you in these situations where you're facing students that you genuinely love and care about. I had a really difficult time as the player, like navigating these battles. Um, and something that I really appreciated was, you know, late game and when, when we are in situations where we had to fight people we knew. Um, the game just says, like at the beginning of every battle, it'll say, "To win, you must defeat the commander. If you you lose, when all of your units fall." Um, and I think for much of the game, it sort of encourages you to kill as many people as you can on your way to the commander. There's items you can get. Um, there's, you know, EXP to be gained by taking a completionist route. And I think, um, you know, the game doesn't, doesn't take any measures to tell you like, oh, by the way, because these are your previous friends that you're fighting right now, like that you should hold back. Like it doesn't say that at all. It's just the very exact same start screen, but the people on the battlefield happen to be people, you know, um, I was like, I remember sitting there for like 10 minutes being like, I can't do this. <laughs> like, what do I, what do I do? Um, and what I noticed is that so often when you're fighting, um, it's turn-based so it, you can move and attack and then the enemy is given a chance to move and attack. And in the battles where you're fighting people, you know, um, often what happens is when the enemy attacks you, they get an attack and then your character counterattacks. Mm -hmm. I noticed that in this battle, um, when someone I knew attacked me, my character would dodge or my character would block or my character would get hit and then the turn would end. So there wasn't mm -hmm. that same exact reciprocation of, oh, I can fight back. Especially, I was especially worried about that because I knew that if my character, even in those automatic counterattack sequences, that they could decimate the other character <laughs> in one hit. <laughs> and so when I noticed that, like the game didn't say anything else other than just acting that way. Yeah. And so I was like, I was like, I feel like this game is giving me the space to decide what kind of person I want to be. Mm -hmm. Am I going to do what I've been told, what I've been ordered to do throughout the whole rest of the game and just clear out this battlefield? Or mm -hmm. is there another way? Um, and there was another way. There was, there was a way for me to get through the battle by not killing anyone, I, anyone else except for defeating the main commander. And it's like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have figured out that out unless I just did it, which mm -hmm. I did. And I'm very glad I was able to do that and that no one else had to die. Um, but the game didn't take any special affordances to lead me to that conclusion. And so I just felt like it was such a powerful choice to be like, even in an, in an impossible situation and where the pieces are already in motion and someone more powerful than you has decided that this is a battle you have to fight. Like I could still decide like who I wanted to be in that. Um, yeah. There was still individual agency. Yeah. And just like, it was really powerful. I was like crying. I was like really appreciative of um, how just by my own empathy or attention, I was able to flip the script within a game that wasn't laying that out for me. Um, yeah. Yeah. Usually when 
so yeah, typically in video games, right? Either you're on a you're on a narrative path that the developers have preset. Um, you have agency in terms of like how you might go about a thing, but like the the enemies that you have to take, like all that is kind of predetermined and you're going to have to do it to get from point A to point B. And that's, and, and the narrative is going to play out the way it's going to play out in most games. When, when there is choice involved, it's very clearly telegraphed, right? It's, yeah. they, you know, they're very clearly, they'll either, it, sometimes it's as blatant as just putting text on the screen and you're yeah. choosing between one or two options. Right. So I think uh, the impact of, of having like the game very quietly offering you a choice without telegraphing it and it being something that you just kind of naturally discovered through your own empathy and your own concern for the other characters in the game. Uh, yeah, I can see why that created such a special moment of feeling so empowered yeah. as an individual to, to both assess that situation and then make that decision and have that be part of the story that you created with the game, even though the game didn't uh, explicitly lay any of that out for you. Yeah. Thank you for that. Absolutely. <laughs> And I think what's so interesting about the, this game is that the more you know, like the more you play and the more times you play, the less, the less willing you are to fight, the mm. less easy it is to battle, which is kind of like the core of the game is the strategic turn-based battles. Yeah. But the more that you play, the less clear and the less righteous that becomes. I think this game reminds us that so much of what drives us to fight is based in our own perspective and mm. other people could be for lack of a better term fighting battles we can't see mm. or have pressures that we're not completely unaware of or have traumatic traumas and histories that we never would have known because we're fighting them instead of talking to them yeah i think too um being so heavily entrenched in the church early on you feel like oh because it's the church because it's holy it must be right and mm -hmm. I think over time, the game asks you to question, like, don't just take what you've been taught at face value. Ask your own questions, like, like develop your own opinion, because religious leadership doesn't just equate to justice or being on the right side of morality. Like, like it's so much deeper than that. And I, I just think this game does an amazing job of, like, helping you realize that on your own without necessarily being like, it's not, the game isn't saying like religion, bad atheism, good. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's really giving you just a lot of different perspectives and then being like, how can anyone make a completely right or wrong choice in this situation? Like it's just mm -hmm. conflict is never that simple, mm -hmm. um, which was just incredible uh, for a game to sort of walk me through. Um, yeah. So I just wanted to read this uh, one quote from one of the characters late in the game. Um, and they say, as survivors, we must ensure that all these lives were not lost in vain. We must see the tragic foundations upon which we'll build our future. May an age of peace rise from the ashes so that all of this sacrifice means something. Um, and so I really think that is really my takeaway from Fire Emblem is making meaning from suffering. like learning your truth and understanding that like there is no absolutely right or absolutely wrong answer who am i going to be in in hell <laughs> um <laughs> wow nbd um and one more thing i know that um so three houses came out a couple years ago and folks probably are more familiar right now with fire emblem three hopes um mm -hmm. which is sort of a spiritual sequel it's like set in the same world same students, same characters, um, but and you're kind of playing a similar story, but you're from the perspective of a student instead of as Byleth, the hero and professor of Three Houses. Mm -hmm. And what I found so fascinating about um, Three Hopes, the game that just came out, is that Byleth, the character you play in the first game, is actually the villain in this game. Oh, interesting. And, yeah. And <laughs> you play as the student's in these houses who are trying to take Byleth down because Byleth has become, because um, of their alignment with the church and uh, sort of the power that comes from that, it's kind of like a, wait a minute, should the church have this much unchecked power? Like, should any one person have the ability to just make or break an entire war? Like, and I just, I love that. I think, 
typically people would kind of have something to say about this beloved character um, all of a sudden being cast as the villain in the next mm-hmm. game. But it's a lot of the same pieces, a lot of the same storytelling. And I think mm-hmm. that too just points to how much perspective matters in mm-hmm. who you're seeing as the hero or the villain. Yeah. Um, there was this quote, uh, the producers and director of the, of the new game um, had some stuff to say about why they made the choice to cast Violet as the villain. Um, so Producer Yosuke Hayashi says, we felt that the main theme of Three Houses was the conflicts that arise from the clashing beliefs of the characters. But among the characters, the only one that had no such conflict was Byleth. This is quite natural as Byleth is the main character and is a character for which the selected route is always depicted as the correct way. In Three Hopes, we decided to portray Byleth as the antagonist as we wanted to further explore this theme. So yeah, going back to, you know, as the main character in in Three Houses, you don't really have so much of that conflict of perspective because you're just like, you're the main character. You have all of the control. You're set on this path. Um, And I thought it was funny, the director... (laughs) Hayato Iwata-san said, making Byleth an antagonist is a necessary development in order to further bring out the character's charm. Because <laughs> it's like, you know, you're kind of an empty vessel when you're the main character yeah. and you can impose your will onto them. But Byleth is also a hero that people have really, they probably like in the Fire Emblem series. So thinking of making someone the villain as a cool way to just get more of their personality is like hilarious <laughs> and also really interesting to me. Um, yeah, that's very cool. So yeah, so I'm just thinking a lot about Fire Emblem. Really highly <laughs> recommend Three Houses and Three Hopes. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm just, I'm reeling. Um, but <laughs> I love that this, uh, <laughs> that you, well, for one that you, you got all the way through this, through the game and, and to hear you know, as we talked uh, last time about how I had I had played a bit of um, Three Houses when it first came out, um, but definitely didn't get as far as you. It's really cool to hear what it looks like from the other side um, and just how deep and interesting this game is. And I'm excited to, you know, talk to you in six months, a year, whatever it is that you get through the next, the next, <laughs> the next full play. Through. Yeah. And, and hear like how that perspective shifts and grows. Um, the, the depth that they are able to put into some of these uh, RPGs is just mind blowing. I mean, I just think about um, Persona Five being mm. like the the JRPG that I've played the most, and like how mm. much that opens up the more playthroughs that you put into it. Mm-hmm. Even that, it's not as in the design of the game as it does seem to be here for for Three Houses. It's it's just really cool how much yeah. you're able to put into there that you can kind of almost like peeling back the layers of an onion. Yes. The experience just gets deeper and deeper. Totally. Um, yeah. And just that, like even winning isn't the end. It's like, yeah. Uh, like, I'll, sorry, one more quote. This character <laughs> says, you know, if we win, it's like, I'm prepared for the inevitable protests and criticism. New ways of doing things are always met with resistance. Like, mm. And this is like about liberating the land from, from, you know, stuff. Like, it's like <laughs> someone's going to have something to say about that. Again, it all comes back to perspective and that's just part of being a human. It's like, there's yeah. no ultimate right or ultimate wrong. So, um, anyway, highly recommend Fire Emblem. Jamie, um, <laughs> what have you been playing? <laughs> uh, so this, this week I, I also dug, dug deep and pulled out a gem from the past. Nice. Um, I, you know, I finished the quarry, which I talked about in our last episode, and I kind of dropped into my periodic gaming ennui of uh, nothing quite hitting. Mm. I tried a bunch of different games and nothing was really sticking. Um, I I was like, uh, you know, I'm a little too tired to really invest in a game. I mm. also like I want a good story, but I I want something that is keeping me active. So it can't just be text based because I'm like too tired. I'm going to just fall asleep. And so I tried a lot of different stuff and, and nothing was quite hitting. And then um, I went through like my my backlog, <laughs> which <Nice>. is embarrassingly, <laughs> embarrassingly long list of games that I have bought. that mm. I just am never going to play. But I scrolled through it on my PS5 and looked at all the pretty pictures. And I was like, I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to go through this and anything that like tickles my fancy. I'm going to I'm going to download it. Nice. And like I'm going to start like this initial like call of like what what might I be? able to play 
And one of the games that got downloaded when I did that was The Last Guardian, uh, which is a game from Japan Studio and Gen Design, published by Sony Interactive Entertainment uh, for the PS4 in December of 2016. It's the third game in like the unofficial trilogy that is Eco, Shadow of the Colossus, mm. and then The Last Guardian. These all three of these games were directed and created by um, Fumito Ueda. Uh, the uh, Eco and Shadow of the Colossus were made when the development team was called Team Eco, and then they kind of became Gen Design. And there's all this behind the scenes drama. But The Last uh -oh. Guardian was the third game. It was the follow up game after Shadow of the Colossus. Um, it was originally like we knew that it, it started being developed in 2007 was originally planned to come to the PS3 and then just kind of like dropped off the map went into development hell everyone oh. kind of knew anyone who was like following Ueda and following Team Eco and 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 who like enjoyed Shadow of the Colossus which I was part of that group hmm. there was like news coming out about The Last Guardian when we would get kind of pieces of what it was going to be about and what was supposed to happen in the game and and people were really excited for it, but it just kept running into delay after delay. They were mm. having issues with the hardware. Um, uh, Ueda and other Team Eco members ended up leaving Sony, and they that's when they formed Gen Design. And uh, eventually there were like rumors that the game had been moved to PS4 after the PS4 came out, but it was kind of assumed that we were never going to get this mm. game, that it was just going to be lost to time. Um, but then in 2015 at E3... Sony rolled it back out. We got a trailer for it and it came out Noise. the year after, which was huge. I mean, I remember seeing that trailer at, e at during E3 2015 and just like my mind being blown. Like I had forgotten <laughs> about this game, this game that I had been like pouring over. I mean, because yeah. like, yeah, 2007 when they started developing it, like I was like pouring over like magazines at like GameStop and oh stuff, like looking for news, like reading IGN and other like written random blogs and stuff just pouring over pictures of mm. of the game and trying to figure out what it was going to be about and then that all kind of like dissipated as the years went on and it was like oh i guess we're never going to get this this game this next game after shadow of the colossus meant mm. so much to me um so it came out in 2016 and despite <laughs> waiting all of that time for it i <laughs> booted it up that like holiday break and played yeah. like 45 minutes of it and was just kind of like i'm not in the mood for this right now mm. turned it off and never looked back fast forward to whatever it is now five and a half years later almost six years later what's uh, different i don't know i don't know <laughs> i was just in the right mood for it so mm. yeah i was going through my backlog i downloaded it and then it was just sitting there on my PS5 like HUD for a week. And I was like, I'm going to fucking try it. I'm going to fucking try The Last Guardian. And within like two hours of playing it, I was like, okay, <gasps> we're doing this. We're going to yeah. see this through. So The Last Guardian is an action adventure game in which the player controls a young boy uh, who is not named in the game. He's just a young boy, maybe like 11 or so. Um, and he befriends a giant half bird, half mammal creature called Trico. <laughs> uh, and Trico is like technically what the creature is, like a griffin or a lion. It's a Trico, but it's also mm. the only name that you ever get for the creature. So I'm going to refer to the creature as Trico. Um, but that's it's not technically its its name. And when mm. I say giant, like this thing is comparatively like. I, I think a way to said it's supposed to be like 15 feet tall or something like that, like 20 mm. odd feet long. Um, it walks on four legs. You should definitely look up pictures of Trico T R I C O. He's cute as hell. He's got kind of like a dog slash cat face with a, this, I don't know. His snout is very interesting like to a describe. Dragon cat dog. Yeah. But he's like furry <laughs> and he's got like little blue horns and then his neck and the rest of his body is covered in these like thick gray feathers and he's got little wings and his feet are, they look like kind of like bird's legs. It's like the skin of, of bird's legs and he's got a big fluffy tail. Um, but like absolutely adorable character design, just like very detailed. Um, and the game, like a lot of, well, like the, like the other games in the trilogy, like Eco, like Shadow of the Colossus, the game is set in this similar, like m sort of mystical land of large, uh, stone ruins. Um, the game uses, like the characters in the game speak a language that's, that's made up, that Ueda and the team made up, that's mm. sort of based in Japanese, but it's not actual Japanese. Um, and like the other games, it's a very, 
quiet game without a lot of dialogue, without a lot of heavy narrative. Um, These games are very experiential and exploratory. Mm. The actual mechanics of the game, you know, you're controlling the boy um, through a typical like third person action game mechanics. You have a jump button. You can like grab and interact with various items. Um, One of those being like you can find these glowing barrels that you can feed to Trico. Um, You can push crates around, pull levers, climb up chains. Mm -hmm. Um, You can run and the boy's barefoot. And it's actually like a thing throughout the game. You can hear his like small bare feet like slapping on the stones as he (laughs) runs around. And even the way he controls is very... He feels like a little boy running. He's like very chaotic and kind of uncontrolled in the way he runs. Mm. Um, So like the mechanics of controlling him are not super precise. And in Mm. fact, that's like a friction point in the game and something that um, I know reviewers took issue with. And it's a thing both in Eco and Shadow of the Colossus too, right? Like these games play like they're older. Even though this game came out in 2016, you can tell that it started development in 2007. Mm. And and there that can be frustrating at times of just like trying to get the boy to actually and the camera to actually do what you want them to do mm. so that you can move through the world the way you want to move through the world can be challenging and I think it's an intentional friction point that they put into the games, but it's mm. not just as it's not as smooth and seamless as modern games. I think modern games are so much about like, oh, as you approach the edge of this ledge, your character is going to automatically like just now and you hit jump, they're going to automatically be kind of pulled towards the thing that they yeah. can grab onto. And that's not a thing in this game. I can run to the ledge and jump and just go <laughs> totally off to the right and fall to my death. And the little boy just screams and you get the game <laughs> over screen and it yeah. reloads, right? Um, so that's a thing but it 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 has the effect of like feeling like you're controlling an actual little boy like yeah that's cool so the actual gameplay of the game you know these are all the things that you can do the game starts the little boy wakes up in this big kind of ruins of a castle um you're kind of you're in almost like a cave there's like sunlight kind of peeking through from above and he wakes up. He has no memory of where he's been. Uh, the The game is narrated by the boy as an adult. So you're getting a little bit of narration from him talking about how he woke up here and he does he didn't mm. know where he was at. Um, and then you realize that in the room with you, there's this giant beast, this mm. Trico, chained up. And Trico is wounded. He's got some spears stuck in <gasps> him. And he's also like clearly agitated by your presence oh. um if you go close to him his he acts like an actual like an animal would his ears pull back his his head goes down his tail tucks between his legs his eyes glow purple and he's making a noise that's not really a growl but it's kind of sounds like a growl you can tell he doesn't want you to come any closer so you're in this big room and the game gives you no instruction of what to do you're just told yeah i just woke up here and there was this creature and i don't know what to do next um And like so much in this game, you have to start as the little boy walking around, exploring, and just intuitively figuring out what you need to do next. And that's kind of the puzzle element of this game. It's not puzzles in the traditional sense, but it's puzzles in that the game really never tells you what you're supposed to do. The only thing you know is that you're in this room and that you probably want to try to get out of it. The game doesn't tell you how to do that. So... From this very first room, as a little boy, you know, I run around, I go, I climb up some ledges, I kind of intuitively figure out how to get into this space, and I find this glowing barrel. Mm. And the game tells me, oh, you can pick that up. So I pick it up, and I walk back out to Trico, and his his ears perk up. Okay. <laughs> Trico likes this barrel. <laughs> the game's like, oh, you can throw this barrel if you hit this button. So I throw the barrel, and Trico eats it. Mm. Okay. Now he seems just slightly less scared of me. He's still pulling his ears back, but he's not growling anymore, right? Nice. And you slowly figure out that, okay, I need to feed Trico. You find another barrel. You feed him some more. And then uh, you can. T- then he starts messing with his shoulder, and you can see how oh, there's a spear stuck in Trico's shoulder. Well, I wonder if I could get up there and take that spear out. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, I can't approach him from the front. He doesn't like that. But if I give him some food and then I kind of walk around behind him, I can climb up on his back and then pull the spear out, ah. right? So you slowly start figuring out how to interact with Trico, how to help him. And then as you help him, his he's able to like remove his chain and then he'll uh, break through the path so that you can go to the next area. Mm. And the game builds from there. So the entire game is then about you and this creature, Trico, essentially helping each other 
move through this giant castle ruins to escape. Um, but it is all grounded in this relationship that you're building with this creature. And in the very subtle, but clear cues mm. that Trico as an animated like thing in the game is giving you. Wow. And it's so detailed. I can t- like, it's very obvious why this game couldn't come out sooner than this. Like mm. this creature, the way it behaves is, is like beyond realistic. It's, it's so, uh, the little details of how he moves and interacts with you and how you start to like, know like what you can do. And then slowly, the more you interact with Trico, the more he becomes receptive to you. So from the very beginning, they give you a button you can press where the boy will call out to Trico. Mm hmm. At the beginning of the game, you hit that button. It does nothing. <laughs> like Trico does not give a shit. He doesn't know you're calling him. He has yeah. no idea what's going on. A few hours in, you hit the button and Trico will come to you. Aww, and the boy like calls buddy. out a word and Trico comes, right? And like a few hours after that, uh, you uh, you don't even have to call Trico. He's just kind of following you Aww. wherever you go. And the way he'll look at you, you know, you start realizing that he's looking at you for things. He's like, he's just watching you. He's engaged in what you're doing. It really reminded me of like the process of even like training our dogs. Yeah. And like how, as they get engaged with you and like learn to look to you for things, how you have more of their attention just naturally. And they just start watching you and how animals learn so much from us like animals are so cued into body language right yes. and so like where the boy goes and if i would stop and turn around and look at trico he would notice and then come to me like things like that where you don't even have to use words anymore mm. the creature just starts to respond to you and you start to respond to the creature you start to learn like what trico's cues are like there's different things in the environment that make trico scared and and you start to spot those <laughs> out and it's like okay i can't take him over here because he's going to be scared of this specific like Im- there's these like stained glass windows that have mm. eyes on them and mm. they scare trico Aww. or like areas where you jump into things that these things that almost look like cages that have this blue electricity and mm. and trico will like hesitate to follow you into these areas things like that mm. where you're you're noticing that he's scared of stuff um a really powerful moment that happens a few hours into the game is, you know, up until this point, at this point, you know, you can call for Trico and he'll come to you and, and he, he's letting you feed him and, and climb around on him as needed. Um, but there's, there's a moment the first several hours in where Trico actually like catches you, like you're, you're doing mm. all this platforming, right. And you're in these areas where you're like really high above the ground. But up until this point, if you fall, you're dead. Yeah. And there's a very specific moment in the game where you're you're using Trico to help get across these like high raised platforms that are very narrow. And as at this point, it was like, I don't know how I'm supposed to get across this. Like I can't jump this and I couldn't find the path down. And I'm kind of just running around as the boy, like kind of puzzled, like how am I supposed to get across this gap? And I look and Trico's on the other side of the gap and I could just see the way he was watching me. Yeah. He was like really intently. His head was following me as I moved along the platform. And he was kind of in this crouched position, like leaning forward. And I was like, will he catch me if I jump? (laughs) And that first moment you jump and it goes into like this almost slow-mo as the boy starts to fall. And then Trico bends down and plucks him out of the air and runs off down the thing. And it was such a, the game was never like, Hey, this is the point Yeah, where if you jump, Trico will catch you. You just intuitively understood that that was what was going to happen in that moment. And it just makes it so beautiful because the game's never explicitly like, okay, now it's now Trico likes you enough that he'll catch you if you're falling to your death. Uh, It makes it feel like more of a real relationship because you actually (laughs) noticed the signs in Trico that suggested that he would save you if you were going to fall. Yeah. uh, If that makes sense. Absolutely. So it feels like you're building a a real partnership Mm -hmm. um, with the creature. Uh, The game has, fantastic sound design it's it's beautiful even for a game that feels like it's older like just artistically it it has a kind of a timeless quality to it that just makes it really pretty um but the sound design is really what gets me you know i mentioned earlier that kind of the kids bare feet slapping on the stone is such a like specific sound that you hear so much through the game there's lots of crumbling as you're like moving through these ruins Mm. Um, they really do very minimal work with the sound or sorry, with the music. So there's specific moments where the score will kind of come up, but you know, moments where there's action and Trico's like fighting and stuff, but 
those moments, you know, that's when the score will come in and punctuate and then it'll, it'll go back down. And there's a lot of silence in the game, a lot of like natural noises, like just the wind blowing through the big open spaces, through the castle, grass and leaves, rustling, wood creaking, stuff like that. So the whole sound design of it is really fantastic and, and really puts you in the space. And Trico as well, being such a large creature, moving through these narrow passages and stuff, like you really feel his size and his weight as mm-hmm. he's moving through things. Um, and I think a lot of that is done with the sound design. The relationship building is fantastic, which I already mentioned, and and that back and forth, how intuitive of the game the game is is so good. Um, the narrative of the game is, I mean, like all of these games is pretty thin in terms of like actual plot. Um, but you do kind of learn a bit more about this space. Um, there's these like armored armor statues that will come to life when you're near them and chase the boy. And as ah. the boy, you can't, you can't fight them. They're actually super creepy. Mm. Um, you can try to like sneak past them and you can run away from them. And if they grab you, they'll like carry you to these like glowing doors and like the game just ends and you know, okay. you know, you'll get reset at the checkpoint. So it's very kind of creepy. Yeah. As you're trying to like figure out the mystery of this place. Um, the only way to combat those armor things is to bring Trico near them because uh, Trico will fight them and, and destroy them and break up the suits of armor. But the boy is the boy. You really can't do anything. So it's really interesting how the game very deliberately does not. This is not a power fantasy game, right? You're mm-hmm. very deliberately. You are this little helpless boy. And the only way that you survive this place is by building a relationship with this much more powerful creature that you don't have full control over that all you can do is hope that the creature will make the decisions that like support your needs to help get out of the space to think is a really interesting, it just really flips, you know, so many games are about giving you the power, you know, in a, in a different game, maybe you would be Trico, (laughs) but in this game, you're the little boy and you're so reliant on building that relationship and trust with Trico um, so that he will help you get out. Mm. Um, but near the, near the end of the game, there's a really fucking amazing moment, um, where you've, you've gone through it, right? You guys have gone all the way through, you've gotten out of this place that you're trying to work your way out of, and you come out into this beautiful sunset and you get just a moment just to exist with Trico before the game ends. And, and ultimately I would say this is, this is a story about, (sighs) I think there's themes of like man and nature and technology Mm. and nature and how these things collide and maybe what our relationship is, as human humans are in regards to nature and how we can, we try, we need to find balance with it, but also we're not entirely of it. And, Mm. you know, this isn't, I would say this is more comparable to like the Fox and the Hound in terms of like the, ultimately the boy and Trico can't, be together they come from two very different worlds but it's like how they how they learn to understand each other in this space and then and then move on so this this moment in the game when you when you come through everything and and you're at this sunset it's kind of the last real moment that the boy and trico get to to be together before the the end of the game which so slight spoilers there but Mm. this is also like a six-year-old game at this point sure (laughs) um and i i found this this really powerful um bit of writing from from Jacob Geller at Polygon in this piece called Reaching the PlayStation 4's Most Beautiful Moment Takes a Lot of Patience. Mm. And kind of the whole piece is about how so many folks aren't going to play The Last Guardian and aren't going to experience this like really kind of quiet, powerful journey um, because the mechanics are, are kind of frustrating and because uh, Trico doesn't always listen to your commands or maybe you're not standing in the right spot to get him to do something. Like I remember when the game came out, there were so many reviews kind of complaining about these frustration Mm. points with the game and and how it wasn't as seamless and smooth as people wanted games to be in 2016. Um, But Jacob writes, uh, there isn't a cutscene where Trico makes googly eyes at you and, and you say, I love you back. As a matter of fact, the last few hours of the game barely give you time to breathe, let alone express your affection for one another. But then just as you summit the massive tower in the middle of the world, right before the climax, nothing happens for Mm. almost a minute. I think about this minute a lot. On an aesthetic level, it's almost unsurpassed. The wind rustles through every one of Trico's thousands of feathers. The white marble glows orange in the fading light. The setting sun burns a line across the horizon. Details fade into silhouettes on top of the tower, and there's no music to distract you from whatever you're feeling. The grandeur of this moment is staggering, especially for a game that has largely avoided dramatic lighting. 
but there are plenty of video games that have beautiful sunsets. What elevates this moment above its visual appeal is that it lets you just be with Trico. For almost a minute, there's nothing else that needs to be accomplished. You can stop and scratch Trico's ears or tickle its belly or just lie down with your friend in the wind and the fading light. For a minute, you can just be a boy with his friend. Mm. So many games tell you how to feel. So few give you the time and tools necessary for those emotions to occur organically. And I actually feel like there's a bit of a through line between like what you were saying yeah. with, with Fire Emblem and how having that moment occur because you noticed it and not because the game specifically held your hand and brought you there yes. is so much more powerful. And yet it was intentional. Like I, I, that is the power of game design mm. <laughs> that they can tee up these moments that they know will probably happen for you. But it's like leading the horse to water, right? You're not, you can't make the moment happen. And in fact, if they had, if, if that had been a cutscene or if the game hadn't brought you to that point, it could have been totally hollow. I mean, I think like Jacob says, there's plenty of games that have beautiful sunsets in them. Yeah. But the fact that the game keeps the control in your hands in that moment and lets you have it be whatever you want it to be opens up the space for that. And if you lean into that moment, it can be super powerful. Mm. Absolutely. So <sighs> that's my long-winded spiel on wow. The Last Guardian. This was a really beautiful game. I'm sorry that I put it off for almost six years. But at the same time, you know, I don't know if this game means the same thing to me in 2016 as it as it did now. Mm. Um, I think that, well, <laughs> I still have never gone back and played Eco. So maybe I'll get on that one of these days. But I think even just, you know, Shadow of the Colossus and, and then The Last Guardian and what Ueda has done with those games is so special and wholly unique i really don't think there are other games like these that exist um so i don't know if any of that sounds interesting if you want to go have a really cute <laughs> cat dog bird friend um maybe go check out the last guardian i'm sure you can get it pretty cheaply these days yeah so that's the last guardian wow. uh, go play it uh, we definitely should get to our guest now for today. <laughs> uh, so today we're talking to Kayla Ankrum, a young adult author known for works such as The Wicker King and The Weight of the Stars. We had Kayla on to chat about why so many adults are drawn to young adult literature, the importance of fan fiction as a safe haven for marginalized folks, and how Jet Set Radio instilled the healthy disdain of the police in her from a young age. Kayla had so much great stuff to say about all of these topics and more. We really enjoyed speaking with her, and I'm sure you are all going to enjoy it too. So without further ado, here's our interview with Kayla Ankrum. Hello to our wonderful guests, and thank you so much for joining us in the virtual pixel therapy studio. To start, could you share your name and your pronouns? Uh, hi, my name is Kayla Ankrum. I go by Kay Ankrum, and my pronouns are she, her. And Kayla, how do you spend your time? Ooh, <laughs> <laughs> since I'm an author, I'm sure most people would assume that I would be reading and, and writing <laughs> and stuff, but not really. I am a huge cinephile. I love movies. Mm, so nice. I literally just watch tons and tons of movies. And then the rest of the time that I am not doing that, I am reading fan fiction. Oh my God. So yes. like, yeah. <laughs> Oh my God, what fan fiction are you reading right now? <laughs> Ooh, I am reading fan fiction from the old guard because I heard some updates mm. about the new um, movie that's going to come out. It's <gasps> Ooh. super cute. So nice. Reading about that. <laughs> Very fun. Um, and Kayla, would you consider yourself to be a gamer? I know you love, you're a, definitely a nerd uh, and, a, <laughs> and a fellow con connoisseur of fanfic. What about the games? Do you play video games at all? um kind of like in a very like mom of five sort of way i'm like on level mm -hmm. three thousand of candy crush oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> i feel like that level of dedication deserves a gamer status but um a lot of my experience with like uh, games and stuff like that comes from like, kind of like design mm. a lot of people that i know work in like um development and mm. like story uh concepting i watch a lot of like let's plays i'm super into like horror games so i'm like entrenched in the community but oh, on yeah. like the outskirts of town mm. i mean honestly like 
games can play so many roles, different roles in people's lives. And I feel like mobile games don't get enough credit. Like as much as people want to hate on mobile games and say it's not real games, um, mobile games market's doing pretty freaking well. And they can, they manage to, you know, keep people hooked in, like, I guess, because your phone is so accessible. So like, if it feels good and it's fun, then like, hell yeah, be a Candy Crush gamer, smash those levels. (laughs) Yeah. And for like street cred level, like mobile games are more similar to kind of like the earlier games that came out. So it's Mm. like, if you had like a really deep history with that growing up, as most of the moms of five do, (laughs) Candy Crush and Bejeweled are going to be appealing because it reminds them of Dig Dug and like Mm. Tetris and stuff. So, Oh my God, Tetris. I remember like when... And my, I remember just watching my mom like playing Tetris like into the late hours of the morning, and like <laughs> every time I walked by her bedroom to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, I would see the glow of and the music of Tetris. <laughs> <laughs> Killer reflexes, <Yeah>. divine. <laughs> um, Kayla, do you have any sort of personal history with gaming at all? Like, is Candy Crush your first foray into games, or were you into any games at all as a kid? Um, I, I was very much one of those kids who would like find one game and like play it until I was like the fastest and the best. And I'd be like, cool. And I would move on to the next one. A completionist. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. My ADHD is on stage. For That's right. One. But um, I was very into um, Jets Radio Future. I was very like exhaustively into Pokemon to the point mm. where I would like break the games in specific ways to like unearth the oh stuff God. that the developers hate inside of them. Ooh. Um, yeah, I was a huge fan of, I was a, definitely a Game Boy girl. I played all of the Harry Potter Game Boy games, which were oh way God, too yes. hard. That was like an adult <laughs> level game. Um, I also had like a Sims game that was just raw as hell. It was mm. way more than you would assume someone would be able to pack into a cartridge. So like it very much was kind of that era. It sounds weird since, you know, we're talking about video games as played by adults in the community as, you know, you know, enjoyed by adults, but I'm very much in somebody who played a lot of video games as a kid and then kind of stopped as I got older and then kind mm. of re-picked up, you know, a little Absolutely. Bit. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, I feel like games as a kid that felt so massive, like um, my, speaking of my partner, I, I he had recently downloaded um, like Pokemon Red um, on an emulator that he's playing on his laptop. And he's like, I remember being like eight years old and feeling like this game was massive, that this map was huge, that I was going on this grand epic adventure. And looking at it now, it's like, it's such like, there's only like three gym leaders and this map is so tiny. And like, uh, I just feel like when you're a kid, you're able to just get lost in content in a way that as an adult, I feel like I have to work a lot harder to get to a space where I can do that. But I would just, when you talked about playing a game over and over and over again, I like really resonated with that. I feel like I would like make up stories in the world on each level, <laughs> like what the character was doing. I don't know if any of that uh, rings a bell for you at all. <laughs> I feel like from a very young age, I was very cognizant of the fact that a game was built by a selection of developers and that mm. those people were people too, and that they probably were interested in making things other than just the traditional game experience. So when I was like, I don't know, 11 or something playing Pokemon Blue, I managed to break it in just the right, right way that I could walk in the grass on either side of Pallet Town. Oh my God. And there was just like all of this space in there. And it was just like really cool Whoa. to me, you know, the idea that I could do the things that the people who love the game enough to build it had mm-hmm. put in there for people who love it too. Right. And the fact that a game is such a malleable form of storytelling, the fact that like two people can have very different interactions with it. And also that they're sort of like breakable, like not in like a bad way, but I mean, the mod community, it's like very beautiful ways that games can be added to. And um, just, I love hearing that. Like, tell us more about the way that you were just like hacking your way into Pokemon. Like, what kinds of things did you do? Um, Well, of course, you know, as the games kind of developed, they started making things specifically for people who are interested in that. Because for the first game, they're just kind of like, don't do those things. Otherwise, (laughs) stuff might happen. And you're like, ha, 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 I'm going to do it anyway. (laughs) And like uh, Pokemon Sapphire and stuff, you could just have an entirely separate quest that is different from whatever it was that you wanted you to do. Like an early, early form of like... uh, Game Boy side quests where you can like, mm. I don't know, sell a bunch of sand and make like an entire glass instrument 
thing or play Pokemon interior design and focus <laughs> on building your house. Just like stuff like that was really fun. And um, they stopped liking people kind of like breaking the games as much. Like as it developed, the harder it was to do that and the less rewarding the things that you would get if you did that work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very cool. So Kayla, you're the author of the award-winning thriller, The Wicker King. You're also the author of an interstellar lesbian romance called The Weight of the Stars and a Peter Pan thriller called Darling. Uh, Most recently, you've also had a story about two teens on a space station stuck in a time loop published in the anthology Out There Into the Queer New Yonder. Um, That just hit shelves a couple weeks ago. Um, And so all of your, every description of your books that I've read have sounded like exactly the kind of thing that I want to read. Um, <laughs> what would you say are some of the themes and intentions that you bring to your writing? Um, this is going to sound so weird, but there's a specific thing about people who write for children, where there are people who write for children because they are writing the books that they wish that they had when they themselves were a child. Mm. And there are people who write for children who are writing for the children of today and the children of tomorrow. So it has nothing to do with them and their background. They're just writing to create content for a group of people who will eventually become the adults that we will have to contend with. Mm. And I'm very much like a uh, team too. <laughs> I write for the children of today and tomorrow, especially because I write LGBT, um, LGBTQ plus fiction. Mm-hmm. Um, when I first started, I used to do this thing. This is very much an aside. <laughs> when I first started, yes. I used to do this thing where I would um, go to panels and I would talk about like, hey, the experience of, you know, our community hall has always been like a um, waiting and wefting in which sometimes there's a whole bunch of really cool media and then sometimes we're not allowed to write anything. And mm-hmm. going into this during like one of the rising, you know, points of that, I was like, I need to be able to write for the kids that have my stuff right now. Also to write for kids who, for whom my stuff may be the only thing that's left. Mm-hmm. So um, when it comes to my work and how it's designed, it is very much designed for the children of now, the children of the future. There is very few reference to time period related stuff. Mm-hmm. There is very few reference to like clothing, anything technology related, because I want it to seem as timeless as I can get it, as difficult as that can may seem. Mm-hmm. But um, I like to write about, about uh, ensemble casts and found families, because found families is such a huge, rich part of our community. Yes. I like to write about parents and also generational trauma. Um, my first book is about an entire town ignoring some kids going through a mental health crisis. And then the second book, that's like 20 years in the future, the entire town sees some kids going through something. They're like, what's going on? How are you doing? Are you okay? (laughs) It's just like, everybody is impacted by the health and vitality of the members of the community that are the most vulnerable. So that's a huge theme. And I also enjoy this kind of like very strange flavor of world building. Mm. Um, My ADHD makes it really difficult for me to perceive a lot of stuff that's going on around me at any given time. So I exist in a world almost like a, like a shadow box. Mm. And a lot of my work reflects that perspective. So there is, there isn't a lot of description. I don't, you know, Oh my God, the sunset was so beautiful and blah, 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 about how it looks (laughs) and whatever. If I want to tell you that someone's in a kitchen, I don't say he marched into the kitchen and sat down at the table and poured himself some tea. I just say he put his mug down on the table. Mm. You know, he's in the kitchen. Yeah. So that's my, (laughs) the framework of my art. Very cool. Very cool. And, you know, you mentioned writing for the children of today into the future. Um, I just like, I feel like no matter what age you are, um, young adult fiction or YA, um, there's just something about it that's so universally appealing. Um, like it's it's for teens or I guess what is the official definition of young adult? <laughs> I think it's uh, 13 to 19. Okay, so young teen to teen. Um, and yet, like, I find even as an adult, the books that are targeted for me are, like, so boring ass and formulaic. Like, really, to kind of get the groundbreaking, heart-racing content I crave, I have to turn to YA. Um, so I'm just curious, as a YA author, like, what is it about YA that's so special and and magical? And, and why do you think it speaks to so many of us? Um, I think that young adult fiction is kind of a soft landing for adults specifically. Um, everything about being an adult is a hypersensory nightmare. <laughs> the responsibility is hypersensory nightmare. Being outside, going to work is a hypersensory nightmare. Yes. Driving is a hypersensory oh God, nightmare. Yes. So, you know, when, when you want to come and sit down and read something, having it be a soft landing 
often allows you to open yourself up to experiencing certain amounts of like vulnerabilities and aspects of adventure and aspects of creativity that a denser book may not allow for after like a long, hard day, basically. Mm -hmm. So there's that. And then there's also an aspect that uh, is a huge differentiating factor between adult fiction and young adult fiction that I had to study because I wrote my first <laughs> adult book recently, oh my gosh. but it is the passing of time within adult and young adult spaces. When you're a teenager, your world is very small and your time is very short. Mm -hmm. So in a young adult fiction book, no longer than maybe a year and a half will pass. Whereas in a lot of adult books, it'll be years, months, just, just all this, this time is going through. And then the way that that is impacted in a story is that there are lots of stop gaps. Lots of, you know, you're going, going, stop, start, stop, you know, that kind of feeling when you're reading mm. an adult book. And that doesn't allow you to just kind of flow through this story, keeping track of it through the fact that it is based on a school year or mm. the seasons. And it allows, it's another version of a soft landing. Mm. And most adults that I meet um, tend to either read young adult fiction beach reads, whatever that may yes. mean to you, <laughs> whether it's like a cheap thriller, cheap romance, cheap, you know, just something that's whatever. And then nonfiction and the, the nonfiction people they're reading, um, is for like a different purpose. It's, it's feeding, uh, intellectual feeding as opposed to soft landing D, um, what is it? Uh, deconstructing what has happened mm. with them throughout the day and being able to soft landing, soft landing, rest their soul. Mm. So that's why you see a lot of people kind of turning to young adult fiction because it doesn't feel like an uphill climb to consume it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That seems like a lot of your books specifically fall within the sci-fi and fantasy genre. Um, what about those kind of speak to you? What continually inspires you about sci-fi and fantasy? I love the world building of reading sci-fi and fantasy. I am horrible at world building. <laughs> so I can't really access that. And I'm like, ooh, I wish I could, but it's just not something that I like have the like intellectual capability to design because of my own disabilities. Mm -hmm. So um in turn from that, I like to settle on the like cracks between the adventure. So all of my stories, whether they're thrillers, whether they're, you know, what have you, they are more about the kind of like gentle and tender moments that make science fiction gives it that richness mm. because you can have, I'm sure you've read a sci-fi novel. That's just so dense with new words and politics. Mm -hmm. You don't know about and all these descriptions of all these interesting the creatures. Intrigue. Yeah, exactly. But if you don't get to know anybody, you don't get to have these, these silent moments. You don't get to see, you know, what these political, you know, machinations, how they impact um, like the people and how, the adventure is based on the desires of the many or the desires of the few, then it doesn't really have any meaning. So when I'm writing, you know, those kind of books, I'm more focusing on what matters. Why does this have impact? And that's all that I can give. So I'm giving it my all. Mm -hmm. mm. So as someone who's neurodiverse and you know, can struggle with some of the um, aspects of writing that uh, we mentioned, just like world building and um, the denser type of type of prose. Like, what does your writing process look like? Because I would say you're quite prolific as someone who's got like four books out and several short stories and looks like you just finished a new book. Um, like, what's your secret? <laughs> Well, I, my, like I have ADHD, but I'm not that heavy on the H. I'm more like a drastic on the A. <laughs> so organization is a disaster. And my mom Maybe. had the foresight to put me into uh, behavioral therapy when I was a kid as mm. made to taking medication. And all the lessons that I learned from that jaunt of two years when I was 12 <laughs> has really given me the tools that I need to be able to succeed as an adult. And two of the lessons that I learned that make it even possible for me to have a career is that um, you don't have to do something the way everybody does it. The only thing that needs to happen is that it needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter how weird way I need to do to get anything done or whatever. Like I could be, oh, I can't do dishes during the day because I'm tired. Every day I'll wake up at one o'clock in the morning and I'll wake up the next day to a sink clean of dishes. Like whatever <laughs> works for you, just do it because sometimes things need to get done. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is if people with ADD work best within confinement and within a box, and if a box hasn't been given to you, you need to make your own box and you need to do mm -hmm. it when it's not like a, a stressor to you. 
So I do this thing where I plan my writing and then months later, years later, I will write it. So I do this thing mm -hmm. where I have like a, um, like a, a planting year and a harvest year. And I wrote all the plots for all the books that I have out currently, including one that's about to come out in 2013 when I was still in college. Wow. And I just wrote like an exhaustive description of what the plot was going to be, where it was going to be marketed to. Like every did all of my research. I packed a binder full of research and I just created that for all of these concepts. And then um, when it was time, I sat down and opened all the stuff and I suddenly didn't have to bear the weight what? of doing the research and the planning. Wow. Wow. Yes. And then when it comes to the actual books, because that is a fucking doozy. That is like a, a doctorate every single time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what I would do is I would create these outlines. I would do three of them. The first outline would be just like a regular, you know, from beginning to end divided by chapters, you know, and I would color code it. Like the whole thing will be in red. And then as I write it, I'll change it to green so I can keep wow. pacing yeah. with that. Um, my second outline is a literary analysis of my own work, like a textual literary analysis. Like I wasn't the one who wrote it. Mm. I want to know what my readers will think about what it is that I've designed. And then my third one is a map of the emotional impact that will people will have from consuming the work. So mm. when I'm sitting down to write it, I'm like, I'm going to write chapter 12 today. Open my outline. This is the plot of chapter 12. Cool. It'll be 14 pages. And I look at my other thing and I'm like, the reason that this has to happen is blah, blah, blah. blah. I'm like, awesome. Glad I remembered to write that down seven years ago. <laughs> I'll go to the next chapter. And it'll be like, oh, you know, this is the part of the book where people are supposed to be feeling really tense from the previous chapter. So give it a little bit of... That's why. That's how I do it. So it's just intensive organization that was plotted by me ages ago when I had more time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Thanks, past you. That's awesome. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. So like, wow. It's almost like a time traveler. Like you're going back because I mean I don't even remember anything from seven years ago, much less what I had for breakfast yesterday. So like, it must be very new and exciting. <laughs> Coming back to these concepts, um, it's like divine inspiration, but God is you. <laughs> yeah. That's such a funny way to put it. Opening your own time capsule. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh my gosh. Amazing. Okay. So <laughs> I'm so not over that i'm you're like uh an oracle that's really cool um i've never heard that before so that's just blowing my mind um kayla <laughs> you mentioned earlier being a fan of fan fiction um and i've also read in some previous interviews that you've done um that your writing um has been sort of shaped and influenced by fandom um and fan fiction um you even wrote your undergrad thesis on the reevaluation and practical application of fan fiction um, mostly trying to translate like for the folks listening at home like what does that mean? Um, from my understanding, um, you know, you're largely trying to speak to an academic audience, kind of make a case for why um, fan fiction deserves more um, respect. Um, but maybe in your own words, like, what has fandom culture taught you about writing? Everything that matters. Mm -hmm. I think um, I have like two viewpoints on fan fiction, depending on what audience I'm talking to about it. Um, I have one that is specifically for people um, in the LGBTQ community. And then one that's just kind of like a generalized, like this is important art form for art sake. And not to go with the sad one first, I'm going to go with the art one sake first one. Um, so fan fiction is a medium that is very, very much one that is largely created, participated in by um, like women and other like queer and just everybody who is mostly focused on playing in a world as opposed mm. to uh, racking up information about a world. There, there's very much like a cultural divide between the way that um, like gendered play with this mm. media that exists. And, and forgive me for being um, binary in description of this. A majority of the like research about this was done kind of like in the eighties and there mm. are very specific words used for different things. Of so course. I'm going to try my best. No, so, we get it. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a lot of research about how um, when uh, women and queer people are interested in involving themselves in media, they see a world that exists and they want to play in that world. They want to explore the riches of that world. They want to dig deeper inside of that world. They want to create art that is an homage to that world that the art is designed to be shared among the, the peers, the little people, mm. um, not held up to the light for uh, re-examination by like the uh ruling class for lack of a better word um and how that's something that's like been such a huge aspect of just kind of like 
human Western culture yeah. about the way that it was done and some of the earliest pieces of media. I mean, you see the way that people react to that, the earliest fandom content, the Sherlock Holmes content, that sort of stuff is really, really cool. And I think that um, the disrespect toward fan fiction is absolutely kind of like a, a, a gendered experience in the way mm. that fan fiction is spoken about um, in media and the way that it is held up uh, before the masses and people who don't have uh, any information about it is also like a specific um, like uh, gendered and homophobic violence. Mm. Uh, for example, I don't know how many of you people are familiar with the like um, uh, Omega, Beta, Beta, Alpha thing mm. that came out and everybody was like, oh my God, what's this? And it was on the news and all these people who'd never been exposed to fan fiction before were like, it's these gross people hanging out talking about gross things because they're gross. And I'm like, mm. okay, this is probably the only intersex representation that I ever had. Mm. So it's really fucked up to hear you talking about it in that way. Um, and then by comparison, um, a lot of uh, men and people who are... Um, who are learning about fandom culture within these specific environments, they'll do um, like fact hoarding. So they'll just mm. hoard lots and lots of information about Star Trek, lots of information about Marvel, lots of information about whatever. They'll hoard resource, they'll hoard comic books, they'll just hoard all this stuff. And then um, they also do uh, like uh, what is it? archival work. So it's not mm. that one is good and one is bad. One's doing one thing that's really important and one other group is doing another thing that's really important. So they'll do like archival work, preserve preservation work um, within fandom spaces. They will do... Um, uh, like revivals of certain concepts. So they will make their little fan fiction. They'll be like, I'm going to take to take this Sherlock Holmes fan fiction to the Sherlock Holmes society and get them to make it a real Sherlock Holmes book. And they'll make <laughs> all of us read it. <laughs> so like there, it's just two, you know, different kind of communities. Yeah. And one, I really feel like there is so much more emphasis on the value of one of them over the value of the other, because people mm -hmm. are embarrassed of writing fan fiction. They feel humiliated by being revealed as having written fan fiction regardless of the quality of the fan fiction, all fan fiction is assumed to be a very, very low quality writing. Yes. Um, it, it, there's just like a lot of stuff going on in, in that specific sector. And then in regards to just like what it means to, you know, the LGBT community, um, when it comes to a world in which the acceptance of media that is created by us and for us is on a, you know, wax and a wet, like Wayne sort of scenario, having a place where there will always be work designed by us for us that is unable to be edited by anyone but us and is mm -hmm. designed to fulfill our desires and has nothing to do with marketing, has nothing to do with anything and will always be there even in the times of the greatest amount of oppression. That is like a very important safe haven for us. And the um, talking about it as in certain ways that they have spoken about like sexual elements within fan fiction is absolutely like um, homophobic violence mm -hmm. and is designed to create the element of these people are specifically sexually degenerate. And this is their sexually degenerate art that is garbage and mm -hmm. deserves to be removed and deserves to be policed. So I think that talking about fan fiction as a thing that doesn't really have any value when it has those two completely separate, but incredibly important and incredibly like, violent aspects to it um it just it just makes me feel like you know whoever it is that i'm talking to um they they just don't have that much academic information about it as a important art form and a cultural aspect and then um when it comes to media we the three of us are in a panel of people who care mm. about the way that human beings interact with media specifically video games mm -hmm. but you know, the way that people act with media is something that is integral to the human condition. Mm. Us sharing stories with each other, us making legends, what our fairy tales mean to us, what our tropes are, why they're important, why they keep coming, why they make them make us feel the way we do. How we share media with each other, what we make after seeing certain pieces of media. The study of that is as important to me as other anthropological fields of study, mm. because it is very integral to who we are. And when you see people in places where they have less than nothing, the one thing that they still keep is their ability to relate to stories, to relate to media, to relate to art, to relate to building this very important aspect of what it means to live and be living. Go read some fan fiction people like, <laughs> I'll be <laughs> honest, like, you know, fanfics when I was like 11, 12, 13, they gave me a safe space to figure out I was gay. They gave me a safe space to figure out that 
maybe gender stuff was happening, gave me a safe space to explore kink. And like, there are so much more dangerous places I could have gone than the Naruto and Sasuke section of the (laughs) gay fanfic site. So like, honestly, um, so much of my own queer identity feels rooted in like hours spent reading Naruto and Death Note gay fanfic. So like, thanks yeah. fanfic authors for giving me that content for free. <laughs> mm-hmm. There's so much love in it too, because there's anonymity yes. about it. That's mm. also important to, you know, the culture, but like you people are making things out of love for thing for others because they love it and they want to share that love. And it's just gorgeous. I'm a fan. I'm a huge fan. The purest. I mean, (laughs) all the effort. Like, some of these were, like, novel-length sagas that you'd be following over months, even years, to reach their conclusion. And Mm -hmm. you would have these whole communities surrounding around these authors who no one knew who they were in real life. No one knew them other than their screen name. And yet, like, they felt like celebrities. Like, they felt like idols. (laughs) And it's like, all of this is happening in a totally silent and compartmentalized space that is both so big and also like you know i navigate away from the screen and that community is is floating in cyberspace it's not part of my life in any way Mm -hmm. yeah it's just amazing um anyway everyone go read some fanfic Kayla, on this podcast, we like to talk to folks about particular video games that have had an impact on their lives. Um, You sort of mentioned earlier Jet Set Radio Future, um, which is basically this action extreme sports platformer. Uh, It was published by Sega for Xbox back in 2002, um, in which you control members of a gang of super rad skaters called the GGs to gain control of a futuristic Tokyo and basically prevent this evil corporation um, from converting it into a totalitarian police state, MBD. Um, it's basically like a queerer and campier Tony Hawk pro skater IMO from watching yes. some <laughs> playthrough videos earlier. <laughs> but Kayla, how would you describe this game in a few sentences to someone who's never heard of it, never played it? Oh, that is such a, the Tony Hawk pro skater is such an, like a good comparison because we had that too, but I didn't like it as much because I couldn't make my girl character hot enough. And I was yes! like, this sucks. <laughs> <laughs> this <is> so boring. <laughs> but um, yeah, um, Jet Radio Feature was a really interesting, like the, um, the design of the game was like very, very bright and very colorful, a little bit kind of like Zelda colors, you know, yeah. like those gorgeous jewel tones, gorgeous yellows and oranges and greens and blues and stuff like that. So it's a beautiful game. It also had a like award winning soundtrack, easily one of the best, like just songs, it soundtracks, you know, it's incredible. Um, but there was this element to the game where it was like, oh, what you are doing will always be a certain level of month because all you had to do was, you know, skate around their version of, you know, places in Japan and yeah. like <laughs> graffiti on the wall. And it's like, oh, if you graffiti over here, you'll get a point. If you graffiti over there, you'll get a point. <laughs> but the longer you keep graffitiing, the scarier the police get. So you oh. start out and like the cops are like, hey, you over there, please stop that. And you're like, no, haha. And you're really like your friends. Awesome, right? And then the next time you see cops, they've got batons. And then after <gasps> that, they've got guns. And after that, they've got like groups of them with better guns. And then Jesus. it gets to the point where they've got like cars and they can shoot at you from the outside of the car. Then you they get like tanks and you have snipers from like, and it's just out of control. Oh, Nice thing. skating game. Right. And the music's just like la 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 in the background. You're just like running for your life. And it's, it's not even played to be like a joke. So it has this like very ominous feel to it yeah. where you are experiencing this incredibly high level of like totalitarian violence for doing the same exact thing that you were doing in the beginning of the game that is still so mild and does not have any real bearing on the mm. life quality of anybody else that's here. And I remember playing that game as a kid and just being like, wow, the Rakaku police are really out of hand. I don't know if I like cops. And like, <laughs> <I'm> like, <"Hi." laughs> I'm like 11. <laughs> just being like, I mean, they could just politely ask us to stop or like, yeah. it over or like bill our families for any property damage. But no, they've decided to put like snipers like, oh my God, for details. But it was a very, very interesting game. And the more that you got further into the game, the more you had access to areas of the city that weren't just kind of like pretty populous areas. Mm-hmm. You could like go underground and like break into old businesses and like do all this stuff and unlock 
you couldn't get like powers. You can get like upgrades to all the things that you had. But at the end of the day, there was this very clear line between like you were a child or a mm. young teenager. The best you got are your skates and your <laughs> your gumption, and yeah. you are being chased by tanks. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God. It's funny. When I was playing the game early, or when I was not playing the game, when I was watching play through videos earlier, it showed, it started in the like start menu, the startup screen of the game. And there's this whole message from Sega that's like, Sega just wants to remind you that while graffiti <laughs> is art and like we support all forms of expression, uh, it's definitely illegal in some places and the cops might come for you. So like, don't necessarily try this at home <laughs> yeah like, love Sega. And I was like, oh so hearing you say that i'm like wow this developers must have known what they were doing because like instilling a healthy disdain for the police is important from a young age <sighs> yeah so it goes yeah <laughs> So, Kayla, um, why do you think Jet Set Radio feature still sticks with you to this day? What ma- what made it leave such an impression on you? Um, definitely, there's like an element um, of it that I said something about how um, you, you didn't really get that many upgrades and you always stayed the same and like the police just got scarier and scarier. An element of that is that because the police are, or because your, your obstacle is like increasing, but your ability stays the same. Cause a lot of the times in games, your ability will grow as you progress in the game and it allows you to build up, um, the, I guess, firepower to deal with whatever boss it is that you're achieving. Whereas in this game, you were pretty much a constant once you hit level two, and then you're just mm-hmm. like that for the rest of the game, your ability to feel like you were achieving something and to get ahead was literally just like your ability to handle your reflexes and your speed and your Mm -hmm. ability to catch things out of the corner of your eye. So it very much felt kind of like Candy Crush where your stuff is basically the same. The only thing that's happening is your ability to do like weird back of your head math about, you know, time and space and physics that will allow you to get to what you need in the game. And that has always been something that has been a very strong skill of mine. And that was the first experience that I had with something where I was like able to identify that as an isolated skill away from, I don't know, being kind of good at basketball, but not really kind of good at baseball, but not really, you know? (laughs) So it was just pure, like, this is what you're good at, Kayla, go do this thing. And I was like, yay. (laughs) So that's why it stuck for me. It's kind of awesome too, that it's like, you never really hit like a God tier in the game. It's really like you have the same, you don't, Like you have the same potential throughout the game and it's like your own strength and resilience that gets you through harder and harder obstacles. Um, I just think that's that's really awesome because like it's almost kind of like for me at a certain level in RPGs, it's like, oh, the enemies that used to kill me in one hit in the beginning of the game, I now can just like breeze through or they can barely hurt me. And it's like, um, I, I think it's rarer and and a lot harder to get through a game that sort of keeps you grounded in that way so Mm -hmm. it's really cool yeah (laughs) kayla um how can folks follow you and keep up with what you're working on next um i am on twitter a lot chronically (laughs) online you can't find me there yes definitely chronically online um and then i also am newly back on tumblr i used to be like a huge tumblr person and i finally came crawling back (laughs) 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 so uh, my tumblr is kaylapocalypse.tumblr.com and my twitter handle is kayla Ingram. um just full name amazing kayla thank you so much for joining us on pixel therapy it's been awesome hanging out with you it's it's been awesome hanging out with you too thank you for having me up for today's session of pixel therapy thank you for tuning in and we hope that listening to our thoughts and feelings gave you some thoughts and feelings of your own if you want more pixel therapy come check us out at patreon.com slash pixel therapy pod where you can snag that monthly bonus episode for just two dollars a month plus get opportunities to get involved with the community and influence the show directly if you're not up for contributing monetarily but you enjoyed this episode you can show your support for free by rating and reviewing us on apple podcasts and following us on twitter and instagram at pixel therapy pod That stuff is just as important, and we appreciate it just as much. Remember that Pixel Therapy is a happy member of the But Why Though Podcast Network, so you can support us by supporting them and heading over to butwhythoughpodcast.com. That's though with a T-H-O. Take a peek at the inclusive geek community they're building around pop culture news, reviews, and kick-ass podcasts like yours truly. And you can keep up with all of this stuff and more by visiting our website at pixeltherapypod.com. 
Finally, since we like to put our money and our energy where our mouth is, we end every episode with a recommended side quest. Thank you, Kayla, for recommending to us this week the Women and Children First bookstore. You can check them out at womenandchildrenfirst.com. And Women and Children First believes in the transformative power of literature. As intersectional trans-inclusive feminists, we believe that books are tools for liberation. Since 1979, they have celebrated and amplified underrepresented voices and believe that in order for feminism to remain relevant, it must be forever evolving. If you're in the Chicago area, please feel free to visit the Women and Children First bookstore. Um, check it out. And to contribute to their um, fundraiser ongoing for the Chicago Books to Women in Prison, you can find out more on their website at womenandchildrenfirst.com. Thank you for that side quest, Spencer. That is our show for today. So go forth, run a story mission, level up some stats, and don't forget to hug an NPC every now and then. We'll be back soon with some more Pixel, Pixel Therapy. therapy. Bye-bye. <laughs>